The 2020 Democratic field is a crowded one, and many candidates are desperate to gain attention. Aside from Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, who were more or less known to all of the voters, all of the other candidates are struggling mightily to get their names and messages out. One such candidate is third-term Congressman Seth Moulton from Massachusetts. The key question that I really want to answer in this video, the thing that interests me, is whether Moulton is a progressive or a new Democrat. Is he one of the people trying to reform America or an upholder of the status quo? And because Moulton's life story is effectively the backbone of his campaign, I will also be taking a long look at his biography. So first we'll look at Moulton's life and then we'll look at his campaign, exploring what he wants to do with the country and why there might be some problems with his vision such as it is. Seth Wilbur Moulton was born on October 24, 1978. At just 40 years old, he is one of the youngest candidates in the field. Born in Salem, Massachusetts, he ended up being raised in Marblehead, one of the wealthiest cities in Massachusetts and possibly the United States as a whole. His family was very well off and they sent young Seth to Phillips Academy, a boarding school and one of, if not the best high schools in America. Using his early advantages, Moulton was able to go to Harvard where he played on the football team as a running back and then earned his BA in physics in 2001. From a young age, both at Phillips Academy and at Harvard, Moulton was known as a go-getter and someone who tried to push others to be go-getters as well. At his graduation, Moulton delivered a speech where he emphasized the importance of service. By that point, he had decided that he wanted to join the Marine Corps, despite the vigorous protest from his parents who wanted him to do something safer and frankly, more white collar. However, Moulton had been inspired to serve supposedly because he thought that as a child of privilege, it was his obligation to give back and to share the sacrifices of the young men and women who defended the country, many of whom hadn't really gotten the same opportunities that he had gotten as a kid. So following the spirit of some of his heroes and a pastor who he claims was very influential in his life, Moulton joined the United States Marine Corps, the most blue collar and hardcore of the various military branches. A few months before 9-11, Moulton joined the Marines and entered officer candidate school. He ended up joining the infantry. Graduating OCS as a second lieutenant in 2002, Moulton was leading a platoon of infantry when the Iraq war broke out in 2004. He held a distinction of being one of the first Americans to enter Baghdad during the invasion. Before his discharge in 2008, Moulton served four tours of duty, all of them in Iraq. During the course of his service, Moulton won the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal and the Bronze Star. There are accounts of the two engagements which earned him those honors, and in both his conduct sounds quite impressive. If you are interested in learning more, I suggest looking it up. It's not all that hard to find. Of more interest than Moulton's war record in the current context of Moulton's presidential ambitions is Moulton's borderline celebrity status while still a combat Marine. Between 2003 and 2008, Moulton was frequently selected to be interviewed by the media, appearing on several different networks as a representative of the Marines. For the most part, Moulton just carried the torch for the Marine Corps, although there were a few instances where he was very outspoken and may have said a couple of things that rubbed a few people the wrong way. However, as we'll see, he still managed to endear himself to people like Stanley McChrystal and David Petraeus, both of whom continue to be strong supporters of Moulton's aspirations. In 2003, Moulton and an Iraqi translator hosted a show in their local area called Moulton and Muhammad, which was viewed by both soldiers and civilians. When Moulton's unit moved away from the area, the show was canceled. 
I assume that there must have been similar efforts throughout Iraq in order to ingratiate the soldiers with the local population. In 2008, during Moulton's last tour, General Petraeus had met him and decided to hand select him to work as a special liaison with the tribal leaders in southern Iraq. Southern Iraq is somewhat problematic, of course, because it is majority Shia, and there is some evidence of Iranian meddling in the region. Certainly, Moulton has brought up that prospect while he's been talking about foreign policy more recently. In 2008, he was discharged with the rank of captain. Many of the people who served with him claim that while he was in Iraq, he recognized it as a war that should not have been fought and wondered if he should do something to prevent other people from being sent into similar situations. It was during this time that both Moulton himself and some of the people around him began to push him to run for Congress and ensure that mistakes like the Iraq War were not made in the future. So this was the more or less birth of Seth Moulton, aspiring politician. Following his discharge from the Marine Corps, Moulton returned to Harvard where he entered into a dual degree program and earned a pair of master's degrees in business and in public policy in 2011. After this, he served for one year as the managing director of Texas Central Railway. Then, in 2012 or 2013, he co-founded a company called Eastern Healthcare Partners, which he often cites in order to call himself a successful entrepreneur. One of his political tendencies that I've noted is that he likes to describe himself as the only candidate to have done or experienced thing X, Y, or Z. And I have a feeling that there's probably a clip out there where he claims that he is the only successful entrepreneur in the field. But of course, we know that Andrew Yang is in the race and he was a very successful entrepreneur. And there's also John Delaney, whose background is in business. So if he slips and says this, and I think it's more of just a verbal tick with Moulton more than him being dishonest, but I don't really know. Anyway, if he is to say that, then at best, he can claim third place when it comes to being the best entrepreneur in the race. But actually, he really shouldn't talk about this period of his life. Because as the Boston Globe reported when he ran for Congress in 2014, Eastern Healthcare Partners had no revenue at that time and had already closed its only Massachusetts office. So it was a failure. And also, given our current debate over health care, I would be interested in knowing exactly what Eastern Healthcare Partners did. Because if this was something that profited off of the for profit health care system, this could be a major millstone around his neck if someone were to really bring it up. So, this is actually something that's potentially very damaging even though it is a fairly minor note in his life, given the amount of time that it occupies. Most of his life was either in the Marines or the last several years have been in Congress. Perhaps one of the reasons why Moulton didn't enter into politics when he first got out of the Marines is because there was no national opening. His local district was controlled by John Tierney, a solid liberal who had a pretty strong base of support and had been in Congress since about 1997. Tierney was a solid liberal and just to give you a general idea of the kinds of things that he stood for, he was in favor of publicly funded elections that would help to fight money in politics. He was in favor of limiting the interest on student loan debt to 0.75%, the same rate paid by banks. And he also worked to expose fraud and abuse by military contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. Of course, quite a bit of money was wasted in both of these wars because contractors more or less pocketed it or failed to really fulfill their obligations. But ironically, despite his work against corruption, both in terms of working against money in politics and in terms of trying to hold contractors accountable, tyranny turned out to be a bit corrupt. In 2010, the first cracks in the tyranny edifice appeared when his wife was convicted for tax fraud. 
and he won his re-election, but it was a tight race. And this is after years of winning by huge margins against very weak opponents. And he was chugging along, and then around the 2012 cycle, the Washington Post decided to investigate a bunch of Congress people who had been allocating federal money into projects that they owned at home. And it turned out that Tierney was one of the 30-something congressmen who was doing things of that nature. He had helped to direct $3.5 million toward a commuter rail station and parking garage, which was not far from a property in Salem, Massachusetts, where he owned a quarter of the building. Now, this is a pretty damn minor scandal, but apparently when combined with his wife's conviction for tax fraud, this made Tierney look extremely crooked. So in 2012, when Moulton almost entered the race, I think as an independent of all things, Tierney just barely won. So if you're Seth Moulton, you can look at the political landscape and it's very clear that there's a vulnerable Democrat. So if you want to run as a Democrat, you know exactly who you need to run against. Defeating an incumbent congressman in a primary is far from an easy task. However, as a veteran, Moulton was someone who the Democratic Party was trying to cultivate. The Democrats were trying to cultivate these kind of candidates who could challenge the Republicans on foreign policy, and Moulton was maybe a little bit more in line with the Obama vision for America. During the primary, however, Moulton denied being more conservative than Tierney when Tierney accused him of that. Moulton, in fact, clung very closely to Tierney on all of the issues. He did not challenge him on a single issue. Instead, Moulton's focus was bringing freshness and dynamism to the race, i.e. Moulton turned it into a personality contest, which was not a bad idea given the circumstances. Tierney had recently had two major scandals which had impugned his character, while Moulton could point to his war record as evidence that he was a stand-up guy with integrity, honor, and all of that good stuff. And since he did a pretty decent job of assuring the voters that he would continue Tierney's liberal policies, no one was really upset about the prospect of Tierney handing over the reins of the 6th District to young Seth Moulton. However, one thing that seemed to reinforce Tierney's accusations that Moulton was a pseudo-conservative was when Moulton received money from a conservative New Hampshire PAC which had never before in its history donated to a Democrat. Moulton quickly returned the money in order to minimize the scandal. However, while it was convincing enough to voters when he moved decisively to denounce this PAC, it more or less was an accurate reflection of where he actually stood politically. Moulton also received the first ever political endorsement from General Stanley McChrystal during this primary fight. McChrystal had just retired from the military and he, even though he was an independent who leans conservative, was a big fan of Seth Moulton and wanted him to enter Congress even if he was doing so as a Democrat. Moulton eventually went on to beat Tierney 50 to 40 in the primary and he became the party's nominee going into the general election. If you've been following politics over the last couple of decades, you know that Democrats tend to perform very poorly in midterm elections. 2018 was an anomaly. In 2014, the Democrats lost quite a bit of ground. However, the 6th District of Massachusetts was something that they were able to hold on to because Seth Moulton defeated John Tierney, who was the only Democrat who could have lost that race. Tierney had barely won in 2012, despite that being a presidential year where Democrats tend to do much better. Moulton's race against Republican Richard Tisey, if you can call it a race, is often seen as a model of civility. I suppose it is not hard to be civil when one candidate is guaranteed a victory and the other one is a Republican from Massachusetts who has come to see it as his destiny in life to be on the losing side of every election. 
Moulton was so confident of victory, in fact, that he bowed out of a debate against TC to attend a New York fundraiser and introduce DNC chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz of 2016 Infamy. This was his first attempt to really ingratiate himself with Democratic Party leadership, and as a veteran, he was someone who was greatly desired by the party. They figured that he would be the kind of person they could put as one of their poster children, a veteran, a young man, someone who is fresh blood in Congress, an institution dominated by the elderly. Moulton eventually won his seat by 14 points, and he was now on his way, having made some early contacts within the party. However, as we'll see, his relationship with the establishment has not remained as rosy as it began. Having looked at Seth Moulton's journey to Congress, it's time to return to the overarching question of the video. Is Seth Moulton a progressive or is he an establishment style Democrat? Well, simply put, Moulton has given testimony in both directions. In his campaign ads in Massachusetts, Moulton identifies himself as a progressive. That's not surprising. Massachusetts voters like progressivism. They elected Elizabeth Warren, and they were mostly willing to trust Moulton because he promised to continue the liberalism of John Tierney. However, once he got to Congress, Moulton joined the New Democrat Coalition, an organization which described its agenda as moderate, pro-growth, and fiscally responsible. Actions speak louder than words, in my opinion, and anyone who calls himself a progressive and then goes and joins the Bill Clinton wing of the party, and make no mistake, the New Democrat Coalition is very much the Clinton wing of the party, uh, it describes itself as moderate, pro-growth, and fiscally responsible, i.e. they are Starbucks Republicans. They will give lip service to racial justice, gender equality, and the gays, but they're not actually willing to legislate anything, and certainly they're not going to do anything to alleviate poverty. It's very much the Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama camp. And while actions do outweigh words, let's consider another quote from Mr. Moulton. I'm not a socialist. I'm a Democrat. And I want to make that clear. That quote, if taken out of context, would sound like something Hillary Clinton would say. That sounds exactly like something that she would have said in one of the primary debates against Bernie Sanders. Actually, I distinctly remember one of the debates where she said she was against Medicare for all because she preferred a, quote, American solution. This is the same kind of meaningless, hollow, bullshit rhetoric that an establishment Democrat would use. So, Seth Moulton, while he's not accepted by the establishment now for reasons that we'll get into, wants to be an establishment Democrat, and in fact, he is a new Democrat. He's a Clinton-style Democrat without allegiance to the Clintons. Before we get into what Moulton is running on in 2020, I think that it's worthwhile to compare that to what he has stood for while in office in Congress. In 2014, when he was still a candidate, Moulton opposed sending troops back to Iraq. In fact, he claims that he has always opposed the Iraq war, and all the evidence suggests that he in fact has. He supports more nuclear energy, he wants to reinstate the assault weapons ban. He admits to having used marijuana and supports legalization. The thing that's interesting about him actually admitting to using marijuana in the past is that until the last 10 years, politicians would always vehemently deny that they had ever touched the devil's grass. Bill Clinton claims that he never inhaled and so on and so forth. Al Sharpton was the first to say, hell yeah, I smoked weed in the 80s, and people thought he was an absolute lunatic. But now, as the debate has moved to the left, it's okay for people to admit that they are human beings and that they, in fact, have gotten high once or twice. So, Moulton deserves a little bit of credit there for keeping it real. Moulton has pushed for a federal grant program to create apprenticeships in cybersecurity 
and create more federal positions in that field. That's an interesting program, but it's a bit technocratic and not the kind of thing that's going to excite very many voters. When I was a kid in the 90s, I would occasionally get on the internet to look something up. Not only was it slow, but people had their own web pages, which were haphazardly designed and oddly organized. For the most part, you don't see 90s style web pages anymore. Most people would refuse to look at one. However, Seth Moulton has one, and it is the thing that describes his presidential platform. What he does is he organizes his platform based on broad thematic headings and then has policy specifics embedded under that heading. Unfortunately, he doesn't seem to understand the relationship between a theme and things related to said theme, as this is the most disorganized web page I've seen in at least 20 years. Moulton supports a public option. He is not for Medicare for all, and therefore he's going to have a hell of a lot of trouble getting traction in the Democratic primary. He claims to be a supporter of the Green New Deal, but he has no specifics, and his writing on the Green New Deal under his subheading is very hard to follow. There's not really much there. It's a lot of empty fluff. He has a heading called Leadership, which is kind of a bullshit heading. However, he does have some good substance there which needed to be better organized. It should have been under something like voting rights. He is in favor of automatic voter registration, which would be awesome, ending gerrymandering, something that needed to happen a long time ago, fighting voter suppression, another great idea, and giving statehood to Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. These are the kinds of things that people need to hear about, and they qualify under the general heading of voting rights rather than leadership free hint for anyone who might be associated with the Seth Moulton campaign. Moulton also would like to abolish the Electoral College, an idea that he shares with Pete Buttigieg and a number of other candidates, something that I think is quite overdue. He wants to end the filibuster, which he lists under the heading Voting Rights, a heading which does not include all of the things that I just listed that actually deal with voting rights. How the filibusters related to voting rights, I couldn't possibly tell you, but on Seth Moulton's website, it is. Whether ending the filibuster is a good idea or not, I don't really know. Under military policy, he has a policy plank on military spending. He says that we should spend smarter and focus on technology rather than on sheer volume of money. I think that's a good idea. And since he has, as a congressman, pushed for more cybersecurity, I think that he has a great deal of credibility on this particular issue. This is a kind of wonky thing, but it is something that could appeal to voters and could sell them on the idea that Seth Moulton is a really smart and thoughtful dude. Just like most of his fellow Democrats, Moulton is trying to seize upon a special constellation of issues where he can claim to be the expert and the person that people should look to for guidance. And for Moulton, the choice is obvious enough. He spent six years in the Marines, won two major medals, so that is the obvious course of action. Moulton accordingly has done his utmost to emphasize how great of a commander-in-chief he would be, especially when compared to Donald Trump, who he characterizes as weak and says that Trump lacks credibility due to his claim of bone spurs that enabled him to dodge the draft in the Vietnam era. There are two points of weakness with Moulton's attacks on Trump. First is that the major problem with Trump is not so much that he didn't serve, most presidents don't, but that Trump doesn't understand military affairs or the world as a whole. Trump is not intellectually curious. He won't really learn new things. Not only that, but Trump is not someone who is intelligent enough or informed enough to listen to other people's counsel and understand what he's being told. So Moulton, rather than calling him weak, should emphasize how Trump is uninformed. And when it comes to him lacking credibility due to his lack of service, that comes off as a tad fascistic simply because, again, 
the presidency is a civilian position, which can be occupied by people with or without civilian uh, military experience. And claiming that any commander in chief needs military experience seems to be calling for a precedent, which would lead to some pretty dark places. In recent days, Trump's saber rattling against Iran has given Moulton an opportunity to stand out and to speak up on the media outlets. He has spoken out pretty vociferously against Trump and his lackey, the mustachioed John Bolton. Moulton claims that he is the only candidate who can serve as a strong commander-in-chief who understands what it's like to be a soldier in the field. Now, he is more of a combat soldier than any of his opponents. That being said, he's not the only candidate who has military experience or has been to war. Both Pete Buttigieg and Tulsi Gabbard served in the military. And in fact, Tulsi Gabbard, through her service in the Hawaii National Guard, attained the rank of major, meaning that in purely military terms, she actually outranks Seth Moulton. But let's not emphasize that too much. Moulton does have the strongest combat record, but when he says he's the only candidate who can serve as commander-in-chief, he's exhibiting one of his faults, in my opinion, of overstating his case and trying to make himself more exceptional than he is, which you could get away with in a bygone era, but today, in the age of Google, you can't do shit like that. In addition to claiming the mantle of expertise in a given constellation of issues, another thing that 2020 Democrats are expected to have is a signature issue, the one thing that makes them distinct from the rest, that special something that special policy or program that will really excite voters and presumably also put America on the path that it needs to be on to achieve the best possible timeline. And for Seth Moulton, his signature issue is quite a doozy. Bernie Sanders is the face of Medicare for all. Andrew Yang is the UBI guy. Tulsi Gabbard is the candidate of peace. And Seth Moulton, is the candidate of universal service. He wants to make service by young Americans an expectation, but not a requirement. And I think that this is a reflection of his personality where he's always trying to urge people to do more and challenge themselves, and where he's really been obsessed with this general idea of service since his youth. In exchange for this service, Moulton says that college or vocational training will be subsidized to varying degrees depending on the years of service that a young person gives. So, for instance, if you were to serve one year in the military, you would get 60% subsidy, whereas if you were to serve two years or three years, you'd get more. Three years is where you get 100% subsidized. Of course, as a former military man himself, Moulton should know that serving in the military for one year makes no sense because of how long it takes to actually train a soldier in a specialty. You would have to spend about seven months training a soldier to serve for five months. The, the system would be extremely expensive and unproductive. Not only that, but it also doesn't really make a lot of sense because Moulton's justification for this is that soldiers would join the fight against climate change in the military. That it makes no sense at all. It would be the same as offering people a job in the mobile infantry in exchange for citizenship. This is something that he seems to have ripped straight out of the Starship Troopers universe. Robert Heinlein may have written a script with this plot device and then thrown it out because it was too stupid. This is a terrible idea. There's no merit to this idea whatsoever. And it also puts the onus of the expensive nature of college education back onto students who are already unable to pay, rather than focusing on the out-of-control cost or the obligation of the country to do right by the younger generation. So this is mind-boggling until you figure out one other thing about Seth Moulton, and then this becomes crystal clear. Why is he so obsessed with this idea of service? And why does he want to tie in educational benefits 
with this universal notion of service? Well, it turns out that the answer is way dumber than you would expect. Having read a couple of different puff pieces on Politico and elsewhere about Seth Moulton, I can now safely conclude that he is in the middle of trying to craft a very specific public image and to conjure up images of a very particular historical figure. In all of his own interviews, Moulton never brags about any of his achievements unless you count the I am the only candidate to do X, Y, or Z lines. Moulton's friends do all of his bragging for him. Moulton would never claim to be a war hero, but his friends speak on his behalf. His former superiors like David Petraeus will also talk about Moulton as a no-nonsense guy who always stands up to authority even when it costs him, and someone who brings a unique perspective to problems. Many of his other friends say that as well. We'll get into how unique Moulton's perspective really is later on. What we see is that Moulton is very consciously imitating JFK. His friends actually explicitly push the things that Moulton will not say. So Moulton wants you to know that he's a war hero, but he doesn't want to say it. His friends talk about his valor, his awards. Moulton wants you to think that he's smart because he went to Harvard. He never says he's smart. His friends say he's smart. Moulton wants you to think he's a successful entrepreneur, and he'll only talk a little bit about it, but his friends will talk more about it. And he himself would never say that he's the second coming of JFK, but his friends sure as hell would. And I can't help but think that his friends are acting on Moulton's own instructions. It also occurs to me that Moulton's stories about how his friends are the people urging him to run are most likely a bit fabricated or at least exaggerated. There appears to be a concerted effort between Moulton and his friends to construct Seth Moulton the ideal Marine Democratic candidate. When it comes to this JFK comparison, I find it rather interesting. Both of them are young candidates from Massachusetts, both of them are war heroes, and both of them are the sons of privileged families who went above and beyond the call of duty. However, once you get beyond those similarities, you see that Moulton's impression of JFK is a somewhat flawed one. JFK had a bold agenda for America when he ran as president. He had great charisma, good looks, and he used soaring rhetoric, meaning that he was one of the best speakers of his day. By contrast, Moulton has a very limited agenda, average charisma at best, decent looks, and humdrum rhetoric. He is sort of a bad imitator of JFK who reflects the style but not quite the substance. Even on the, even on the style, he falls pretty short. It's sort of like in the early 2000s where everyone was trying to play like Michael Jordan and it just ended up being the case that he had a lot of players shooting mid-range shots they could barely make and having awful efficiency, but still looking a little bit like Michael Jordan just on his shittier days. That's effectively Seth Moulton doing his JFK impression. It's not that impressive, it's not effective, and unless Moulton or one of his friends suggest it, it's not something that you would ever think of on your own. Not being Jack Kennedy is far from Seth Moulton's greatest failing as a politician and as a presidential candidate. His signature issue is not one which will excite voters. If anything, the idiotic idea that he has for national service will most likely repel voters because it has fascistic overtones and it fails to solve either the problem of education or the problem of climate change. Moulton wants to place the focus of the campaign not on his issues, which are all mostly crap, but on his person. However, what he fails to understand is that while he is impressive, he's not inspiring. To be inspiring, you either need to have a vision that people can get behind, or you need to be absolutely unique and really stand out 
above and beyond everyone else. Moulton has a great record in terms of his personal life and his military service, but just being a child of privilege who eschewed that to serve as a Marine does not a presidential contender make. JFK had more going for him, as we pointed out earlier. Moulton doesn't have the assets JFK had. He, JFK had the platform and the charisma. Without those two things, Moulton is just a shitty imitator. He's also a kind of acolyte of the establishment in a year when the establishment is still in the doghouse with many voters. And because of that, he doesn't have a clear lane to run in. He's running on a lot of the same issues as the establishment candidates, but he can't expect any support from the establishment. He's clearly not a progressive, so he can't run as a progressive. That's a big problem. I don't really know where his path lies. There's also no hint of him even having the ability to produce a political vision. Just looking at his campaign website and the limitations of his ideas such as they are, this is not someone who is capable of producing an original thought. And that sounds like a harsh criticism, and it also sounds odd saying that about someone who has degrees from Harvard, but there are plenty of intelligent people who lack the capacity for original thought. And Seth Moulton may very well be one of them. Another person in that camp is Hillary Clinton. Name one time that she said something original or unique that she didn't borrow from someone else. You can't. And of course, the biggest flaw of all, every presidential cycle, the economy is either the number one or 1A issue. And Seth Moulton, throughout the entirety of his political career, has never said a goddamn thing about wages or inequality. If he has, it's buried deep in the back pages of a local paper. This is someone who has no economic message or record. He has no interest in economic issues. <laughs> that spells doom all by itself. You could cure everything else, but without that economic message, he's basically back to Cory Booker territory. It's not going to happen for this guy. The deficiencies massively outweigh the strengths. Because his only strength is his personal biography, which again is impressive but not inspirational. It's not enough to put him over the top. Just on the off chance that Seth Moulton manages to emerge as one of the major neoliberal challengers in the race, I would like to explore the nature of his relationship with the establishment. As someone who is socially liberal and fiscally moderate, Moulton more or less fits the mold for what a neoliberal Democrat looks like. When you combine that with his excellent war record, this makes him someone who could appeal to independents who are a little bit more conservative minded and some Republicans who are not super big on Trump. So you would think that he would be the kind of guy the Democrats would be eager to push for a national profile, whether that is as president or as a future leader in the House. However, the Democrats right now hate him, and by Democrats I mean mostly Nancy Pelosi, who is the most powerful Democrat in the country at the moment. He challenged Pelosi in 2016 by backing Tim Ryan, his friend. But he seems to have actually incurred more hatred than Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan was never a veteran, and he was never quite as approached as Seth Moulton. Moulton was seen as a superstar in the making, so just like Tulsi Gabbard, he is regarded as a traitor by the establishment, and the establishment hates traitors worse than they hate outright progressives and outsiders like Bernie Sanders. He is viewed as an overambitious backbencher who challenged Pelosi and others without presenting an alternative outside of shifting leadership to a younger generation or to call back to Moulton's 2014 campaign, he was saying that the Democrats needed to focus on freshness and dynamism and shift from Pelosi to Tim Ryan. He didn't want to see any actual changes, just a change of personnel. And although Pelosi and others will bitch and moan to no end when progressives call for a change in policy, they also complain even harder 
when other people try to take their ideas and take the mantle from them. So for that reason, he is absolutely despised by the establishment of the party. And if you look up any of the various puff pieces, you'll see that there's a section by Moulton's friends, and then there's a section by anonymous aides, staffers, and congresspeople who all basically call Moulton a piece of shit. So those articles are interesting in how dramatic they are, but ultimately these are not all that important because Moulton most likely isn't going anywhere. Moulton is aware of all the people who have expressed misgivings about him, but he assured the reporter writing for Politico that many Democrats have secretly told him that they support his efforts against Nancy Pelosi. Whatever the truth might be about whether people actually support Moulton's efforts against Pelosi, the fact remains that he has friends who used to be in high places and enemies who are currently in high places, and that doesn't bode well for him. Just to use one analogy, look at where Ted Cruz was in the 2016 Republican primary. He is very much in line with the Republican establishment when it comes to policy. However, he defied Mitch McConnell, and therefore he was despised. The Republicans did not rally behind Cruz to defeat Trump in the primary because they hated Cruz, although Cruz very much lined up with what they wanted to do, whereas Trump did not. I think that if Moulton were to emerge as a major anti-Bernie candidate, that we might see the Democratic establishment fail to rally behind him for much the same reason that the Republican establishment failed to back Ted Cruz. In conclusion, let's look at Moulton's chances. Moulton is a candidate who happened to be born a little bit too late for his own aspirations. Had Moulton been old enough to run for president in 1996 or 2004, he would have been a formidable contender. His politics match that bygone era perfectly. However, the field is extremely crowded, there are plenty of people just like Moulton in it, and anti-establishment sentiment is such that someone like Moulton will have a hell of a time winning. Moulton currently lacks a clear path to emerge from the pack. Because Moulton has nothing unique in his political record or in his platform that would really appeal to voters, I don't really see him winning anything. And as I stated earlier, Moulton seems to be the kind of person who is not capable of originating political positions that would really inspire or interest anyone. So I don't see Moulton turning it around with some brilliant new policy that will excite voters. If his current signature issue is any indication, Moulton is someone who should avoid talking about policy at all costs because all of his original ideas, such as they are, are absolutely terrible.